the cook-along episode today, I am going to do really lovely things that I've just picked from the garden in a tempura batter. And over the years, I've experimented with lots of things that you can just dip in a batter and shallow fry and then serve them with a either a, like a tamari or a soy or a chili dipping sauce or whatever you want, or a aioli or a garlic mayonnaise or just a garden mayonnaise or herb mayonnaise. Anyway, I just love it. It's the way of using very fresh produce um, to its absolute best, I think. And so that's what I've got here. I've got sage leaves, which are brilliant in tempura because they kind of hold, they're sort of furry a little bit, and so they hold the batter incredibly well. And I'm not going to do this today, but you can do an even more fancy thing where you have one sage leaf, an anchovy fillet, and another sage leaf, then that into the batter. And, you know, serve sort of six of those as a starter with a dipping sauce, and it's absolutely fantastic. Nasturtium flowers, um, I've picked these and I've left the stem on because they are then really nice um, to dip into the dipping sauce. I've got some courgettes with their flowers still on, which I'm going to use. I've got an aubergine, which I've just picked. This is Moneymaker, and that's really fantastic sliced. I've got these rather amazing um, yellow beans, but any beans are fabulous, I think. Um, and those are blanched just for a minute and then put in the tempura batter. So, you know, the world's your oyster, and I do it at all times of year, whether it be spring with perhaps some citrus and, you know, your first peas or um, even broad beans in their pods when they're tiny, really wonderful, the first baby courgettes in the summer. Again, loads and loads and loads of different things. And even through to the winter, things like kohlrabi in a tempura batter is delicious. So let's make the batter... Um, very, very quickly and simply. So that's 150 grams of plain flour. And I used to sift this into the bowl, but actually what I've discovered is it's fine with a bit of lumps because they kind of explode and, and, and make it even kind of crunchier and area. And then um, I've got here corn flour, and that's really essential. That's what the Japanese use in their batter to make it so light and fluffy and crunchy. So 100 grams, a little bit less than the plain flour, and then just 10 grams of baking powder to again help fluff it up. So those are the basic dry ingredients with, of course, salt and pepper. So I've got Himalayan salt there, lovely pink mineral salt and pepper um, I can add or add later. And then what I've got here is, is um, I'm not using an egg, makes it much fluffier. I've got 375 mils of cold sparkling water. And I'm just adding that into the center of the flour mix. And you want to go, I mean, I have actually measured it, but you want to go till you've got the thickness of like a double cream. Um, and so you don't want it too loose, but you don't want it too, too stiff either. So that's a little bit too dry. So I always keep this beside me. Um, so, and you can see that or hear that frothing. So that's really nice, cold, frothy, sparkling water done from the soda stream. And then I'm just going to beat it. Still a little bit too thick. So really, I think it, I'm going to change it to 500 mils of water because I think it needs it. Now you don't need it to get super smooth. So you're not making a bechamel here. You're making a batter. <clears throat> but that's the right sort of consistency and I'm not worried about those lumps at all. I mean, I don't want massive lumps, but that's it. Perfect. Right, I'm gonna leave that to rest and the starch molecules to expand a bit and make it even fluffier. And meanwhile, I'm going to put on my 
vegetable oil here. And if you've got a deep fat flour or whatever, that's great. Um, I haven't got one in here in the house. And so I just use my biggest, deepest pan. And, um, and I'm literally, you could do it in a just shallow frying it, but you just need to be a little bit careful, obviously with hot oil. And so here I've got a slice of bread and you can have a thermometer, but I've only just put this on. So in a few minutes, I'm gonna go back when I just see it starting to roll and I'm just gonna try a little cube of bread um, and just see that it's hot enough to really quickly crisp up and, um, and cook whatever I'm gonna put into it. So have at the ready a plate with a napkin or some, or a kitchen towel or whatever to absorb some of the fat. You could use kitchen paper, but um, it's quite wasteful and perhaps not so environmental. So I tend to use a napkin and then can wash it really easily. So it's just beginning to heat up now. And while it's doing that, I'm just gonna start dipping some of these things into my batter. And so, first of all, my aubergine slices. And you want them about a centimeter or so. And then that will cook through, um, but not burn the batter. So with a courgette, I mean, that's a really perfect little baby one. So you just need to do a couple of things. The first is you go into the center of the flour and you remove the stigma because that's a little bit sort of chunky and, and not so nice to eat. And then I just want to remove the bit that attached it to the plant. And then I just cut down, not all the way, but sort of two thirds of the way along the actual fruit because then the batter will go down in here. Otherwise, what happens if it's like that? This can remain uncooked, and raw and cold, which isn't so nice. So the first thing is go into the center of the flour. So you can see the fat's coming up to temperature now. Remove the stigma from the center, like that. Remove the bit where it attaches to the plant. And then just quite carefully go to the center. So I'll carry on doing those. So now to test the oil, which I can hear is getting quite excited. So I'm just going to pop a little cube of bread into the oil. And if it fizzes immediately, I know that I'm about right. Not quite, not quite. So it sort of doesn't go psh. Um, so that isn't quite ready. So I'll fish it out and try it again in another minute. And go on prepping my veg. This is one of those things that um, you don't want to cook for too many people. <laughs> we, um, we had a lovely press day here in, in the spring and um, I persuaded Sophie, our chef, to do it for 36 people for lunch. And it, poor thing, it was just, it was horrendous. It was too much. Um, because you're, you know, you're almost doing it per portion, really. Um, so I reckon four people is ideal, possibly six, um, but, but not 36. <laughs> um, and so it's one of those things that's quite expensive in a restaurant, which is why it's so nice to have it at home because um, it's, it's not difficult. Now for this one, which is slightly bigger, I'm actually gonna do a right angle cut like that. Because again, this will be really tasty when it gets to this size, but you just want to get the batter and the heat and the oil right down into the fruit. And then this one's lost its flour. That doesn't matter at all, but I still want to just cut down like that. Okay, so let's try again. I think we've been about another minute. So in goes my next cube of bread. And it immediately is sizzling. 
and it's got bubbles all around it. So I know, I mean, you can use a thermometer, but I know that that is now perfect temperature. So I take that out and then I start dipping all my ingredients. So I'll start with that guy first because obviously it's bigger. And so it's gonna take that little bit more cooking. Makes a bit of a mess this, I'm afraid. We haven't done that one yet. Whoop. And this is why you need the double cream consistency because if it's more watery um, and looser than that, then obviously you make even more of a mess. But you can see why the flowers are just so great because they, they can, you can use them as a handle. And then I'm gonna move on to some aubergine. I could use tongs. I'm a great, I'm a great cook using my hands, I have to say. Now you never want to add too much into the pan at once because of course everything that you add in will decrease the temperature of what you're cooking. So I'm just gonna do those to start with. And I could make this even more wonderful in a way by um, stuffing those courgette flowers and I could do a mix of like cream cheese, Philadelphia, whatever, peas, thyme, or I could do cream cheese, pine nuts and basil and um, just make a mix and then just put a teaspoon of that into the flour of the courgette and dip it into its batter in just the same way. So um, it's a little bit another stage, but it's not difficult. So the big one is cooked on one side, so I now just want to flip it round. Yummy, it's already looking delicious. And it hasn't lost its temperature, that's the point. That's why if the fat has got up to a good temperature, it's, um, it's exactly what you want, because I can see they're really cooking well now. Something kind of slightly magical and witchy about it. I, I, I love it when they sort of puff up. Let's do a nasturtium as well. Okay, I reckon that big guy's probably ready to come out. You could use tongs, but this is fine. Careful that I just washed my hands, that wasn't very sensible. You don't want water to get near your hot fat. And I just want to show you something, which is as you strike it, can you hear? It's really crunchy. <laughs> and that's what you want. Okay, in goes. Hoik out that aubergine. And in goes the next batch. I'll just show you a nasturtium. So the nasturtium. In it goes. Another nasturtium. Nasturtium leaves are also delicious. So this is a whole little nasturtium plant and that will be fantastic. Just check that there are no black flies. So that's a whole nasturtium plant. They cook very quickly, of course. Sage leaves cook super quick too. So the sage leaves leave the stem on because that's the handle. Out come the flowers now. So that's the nasturtium plant. Delicious, lovely shapes. That's the other nasturtium called red velvet. And then here comes the sage. And the next aubergine is not quite done. So I'll carry on doing that. And then I'll show you how I plate it up. But 
summer garden tempura from just outside there. Nothing lovelier. I just, I love it. It's a real pleasure to make. Got to be in the right mood, not stressed. Um, and then, yeah, so tasty. Salt um, and then a dipping sauce. So now I've fried a good range of different things. Um, I'm just going to plate it up. So I've just got one portion here. So I'm going to do a couple of the courgettes and their flowers. Um, one of the aubergines, or maybe two. <laughs> um, sage leaf, because they're just so lovely and pretty. Nasturtium flower, another sage leaf there. The whole nasturtium plant, which I just love the shape of that. And one last courgette. And then some chili dipping sauce and a, a little lemon segment. Oh, mustn't forget, you need a bit of salt. It's really nice. It needs to be a little bit salty. So a little bit of salt over the top. So, so nice for a summer lunch, a summer starter for an evening feast. Um, so many different ways. Garden tempura on a plate. Mm -hmm.